songwriter, producer, and vocalist. Pooh Bear went from being homeless and broke to being a go-to hit maker for the biggest artists in the world. This is his blueprint. You grew up in Connecticut. A week after your parents split, a yes. tornado hit your house. Yeah. Were you in the house when that happened? Yeah, it was an apartment, and I remember my brother trying to close the door, and the door just kept opening up from the pressure from the tornado, and we didn't know what was going on, and we went down in the basement, and of course we forgot our bird, the parakeet, in the kitchen, and we came upstairs, we were like outside. It was like everything was gone, but the bird survived. How did the bird survive? I don't know. The bird survived a lot throughout my life, like shootouts. And then he, then he died, and he just died of natural causes one day. It was crazy. <laughs> Growing up, what was the role of music in, in your household? I was like the only one. I used to sneak and listen to Stevie Wonder at night just because my dad was really strict, like preacher. My mom was, you know, really, she's still really religious. So I used to listen to, I just called her to say I love you. <laughs> like it was like, like I was listening to like Easy e or Too Short, but it was like, <laughs> I just called her to say I love you at like three in the morning and headphones looking out to make sure nobody catches me. How old were you when you wrote your first song? 11 years old. So I wrote a lot of whack songs. I think that in order to get to a good place in anything, I just feel like you gotta get a lot of the, the, the whack out of your system. And I signed my first record deal when I was like 12 years old to an independent label, and they gave us an advance um, in the form of a jean suit. So I didn't know that we were supposed to get like a cash advance. For you and how many other people? Just me and my friend, it was, our name of our group was called Young Harmony. But um, we both, I had a yellow green, a yellow jean suit, and he had a green jean suit. It looked like a Sprite commercial. <laughs> and um, that was it, we got ripped off at a real young age. So how did you go from being 11 and writing your first song ever mm -hmm. yeah. to being 12 and being signed to a recording contract? In 1990, it was Atlanta was like the new mecca of the South. So it was kid groups like Another Bad Creation, Criss Cross, and um, a, lot of, a lot of successful kids. And I'm like, whoa, you don't have to be an adult to be in the music industry. So it kind of gave us hope and then inspired us. And I created a dance group with kids in the neighborhood. Our first single was called She's Turning Me On <laughs> at age 12. So I don't know, I remember my mom did, did feel really weird about that. She was like, oh my God, she's turning me on. And I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. But, um, <laughs> and then from there, we added two more group members, created a group called Friction. And um, we, you know, we ended up getting a, a deal with LaFace Records for very short period of time and our manager kind of disappeared with the money and <laughs> kind of. So yeah, <laughs> what are the most important things you're learning during this period? Just not to trust people, you know, Red from ABC became my manager, which he was just like one year older than us. He was like 13. <laughs> <laughs> so he was our manager and I remember making a song with my cousin dissing Criss Cross because they made a song dissing ABC and I was like, yo, that's my manager. We got beef now, you know what I'm saying? It was kid rap beef, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and Red, he took it and I, I remember, I'll never forget, they disappeared for like six months and I was like, man, I guess he's not our manager anymore. And then my friend, when I was in the seventh grade, my friend came to school, he was like, yo, you heard the new All For One, One For All Biv 10 soundtrack? And I'm like, nah, he's like, yo, your rap is on there. And I was like, whoa, and I listened to it and it was on there. Then I go to read the credits. Not only did I not get credit, neither did Red, who stole it from me. <laughs> like, <laughs> his manager got publishing and credit. So at a young age, I just was taught, like, just not to expect people to be, you know, honest and good. So, as you're going through high school, can you imagine any reality in which you were anything but a musician? No, that's the crazy part. Like, I never had a backup plan. <laughs> it was like, and my teachers used to say, you need to do, you need to pay attention to school because only 1% of people make it in the music business and you're not that 1%. When my teacher said that to me, I was 15 and I had a song on the radio with a group called 112, my first song called We Could Do It Anywhere. And so I never thought about like, if this doesn't happen, what am I gonna do? Never, not once did I have a come up with a backup plan. So thank God it worked out, but Jesus. During that period though, you, you move from being the face of the product to becoming 
a behind the scenes player. You start yeah. writing for other people. Yeah. What was that process like? The ultimate goal was to be able to take us out of the hood, buy my mama a house. I had some success and it's just a little bit like natural jealousy. And I was like, you know what? I don't have to feel like this. I just want to write songs. I don't want to be in a group. I don't want to sing anymore. And made a conscious decision to to quit my group and just focus on writing songs for other people. And I never really honestly had a real desire to be famous. I just wanted to be able to just make a better living for my family. How does the process of being a songwriter work? Like Peaches and Cream, mm -hmm. did you have the beat and then you wrote the song to it? 112 had that beat and they flew me from Atlanta to New York and they were like, hey, we got this beat, but it's really weird and we just, you know, we, we can't hear anything to it. And I remember going to the studio and hearing the beat and then humming the melody to the And I was really into major minor melodies, so I was like, ooh, this is the perfect time to use a major minor melody. And then the Peaches and Cream just came from me wanting to do something weird and do something that was perverted that could go over people's heads. So still to this day, a lot of people don't know that Peaches and Cream was an oral sex anthem. You know, so it's like doing something that... I put that, that together, by the way. Yeah, the you did, right? Thank you. It's little hints in there, but for the average, I knew because there's a lot of kids and a lot of parents was like, oh, my kids love your song. Like, you wouldn't let your kids listen to that if you really knew what it was about. And I remember Puff saying to me, like, Peaches and Cream. Yo, do you, you sure, man? You don't think Peaches and Cream is weird? I'm like, I love it. And then he asked 112, and they were like, yo, we love, we love that shit, man. They're like, we think it's dope. And then Puff was like, man, I don't know, man. And then it ended up being their biggest song of their whole career. You're in the, the studio with Puff. Yeah. And like, what is that pressure like to be such a young person with people that are so established, you know, looking to you for guidance or to confirm what people should do? I was really quiet back then, man. And I was like always, I remember Puff telling me that he thought I was security for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, you know what I mean? Everybody was like, man, you're not, you not 112 security? And I'm like, nah, man, the right songs. Just trying not to get in the way and trying not to, you know, I didn't want to let anybody down. And at the same time, just trying to deliver. What what comes next after 112? After 112, man, I ran into these producers named Dre and Vidal from Philadelphia. And um, they created Neo Soul, you know, the sound. And they were like, hey, man, we want to bring you to Philadelphia. So they moved me to Philadelphia. We did a record called Superstar. And L.A. Reid heard it, and he was like, I want Usher to cut that song immediately. And so we went to Atlanta, cut Superstar, then we did a song called Caught Up that ended up being on an album called Confessions. Finally, I had another record on the radio that, you know, caught on and did really well. And um, that even, you know, opened up the door more for me to, to work with artists like Chris Brown. At that era, like a writer from around 2005 to 2008, I moved to Miami. And I was supposed to be there for two weeks. And then Scott Stewart, Scott kidnapped me. He was like, no, you need to live here. After years of putting in work in the studio in Miami, Pooh Bear had helped craft chart-topping anthems and timeless hits, but soon he realized that he had very little to show for it. I've read the stories about yeah. Scott Storch yeah. when he was really doing it. How, how crazy was the environment to work in? You know, it started off amazing. Like, first year, we, we placed 160 songs. The next year, he decided to build a studio in, in his house, which is not, I don't, I wouldn't recommend anybody to put a studio in your house, because you always feel like, Oh, I can get, we can always work. It's art there, you know what I mean? And before we would drive to the hit factory, so it was like we were going on a job, going to work. And him having, you know, 16 cars and the like, we lived in a 20,000 square foot mansion on Palm Island across the street from Al Capone's old house. And um, just staying in the biggest suites and I'm just like trying to talk him into not flying private. And I'm like, look, it's gonna cost you 300,000 to go from Germany to LA or 30,000 for three tickets, because there's only three of us. So he's like, no, man, I want to smoke. And I'm like, so you want to pay 300,000 to smoke? And then literally, he might smoke one cigarette on a plane in 14 hours. <laughs> so I'm like, I like nice things, but just having the idea of like having a limit and being able to understand that 
this stuff doesn't, you know, it's not, it's, it might not be here forever. And then seeing him lose everything. Were you there when that all happened? I was there because I'm loyal, I'm a Virgo, so I'm there when, I'm there when he was on top, I'm there when they took everything, you know what I mean? Even though he never honored our deal to make sure that I, I made a certain amount of money a month that he was just supposed to pay me so I wouldn't have to work with other people. And he never gave me what we were, what, I, what we agreed on. Ended up, you know, having to start my whole life over after Confessions, like after this big album, um, you know, I'm, I moved to LA and I'm like sleeping in studios and it's like, you know, just finding myself literally starting over and, you know, just waiting on September and April, you know, for royalties. And from there, I moved to Vegas and um, ultimately I, you know, met Justin Bieber, you know, at a birthday party. How do you go from there to winding up in the studio with him? It, it went from, you know, me being introduced to him and, and then that person who introduced us just started playing my songs and Justin was like, who is that? And it was like, oh, that's Puber, that's the guy you met. And he was like, oh, give me his number. You know, and then he just called me one day randomly. He was like, yo, it's Justin Bieber. And I'm like, oh, happy birthday. And he's like, can you flip this record, this um, Craig David Fill Me In record? Can you take the chords and flip them and write like a whole new song? And I was like, yeah. And I went in, I did it in like 30 minutes because I was so inspired. Sent it to him. He was like, can I fly you to Boston? I was like, yeah. And then we just went around the world and we're just like, it started off with that one song, which ended up being on journals um, called Recovery. Then from that, he, he wanted like songs that I had for myself, but they were just way too mature for him. And I was like, I just found myself telling him no a lot. And he was like, yo, I want that song. I'm like, you can't because this is not your audience. Like, not yet. You gotta wait like a few years. You can't sing that, that edgy. And then, you know, I mean, I remember going to Miami and I just started thinking like, you know what? Man, I could flip a couple of words in this song and make it younger, you know what I'm saying? And make it make a couple make a couple of double meanings out of it so it's not as edgy. And then that's where like songs like Hold Tight and the album Journals came from. And then just being able to really see Justin for who he really is, you know, it just allowed our relationship to, you know, get to that point where songs like Where Are You Now, you know, and what do you mean? And then purpose, you know, that that came from if we hadn't did journals, that R&B album, you know, which still sold without any promotion, there would have, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if there would have gotten to, we would have gotten to purpose. As Pooh Bear and Justin Bieber's bond grew, a new inspirational sound began to emerge that would fuel the pop star's return to the spotlight. When you guys went in to work on purpose, mm -hmm. did he have a sense of how important the success of that album was to his overall career? I just think he wanted to make a really positive album. You know, I can't speak on his behalf, but I'm sure he looked at it like, wow, he just changed up everything, you know, and, and got to a really cool place and a positive place. And he was like, yo, I want to make an inspirational album, you know, and, and Believe was inspirational. This was just a little bit different because he was, you know, older and he wanted to sing more mature records. And he was just like, yo, let's just make inspirational music. So. I guess as, as a collaborator that worked on it, yeah, yeah what, what pressure did you feel in well, terms of delivery? Well, first of all, I thought that he wasn't, after journals, you know, I didn't think he was gonna work with me anymore just because it wasn't as successful as his, his prior albums. Throughout journals, we were always, always recording. And um, I just remember us working for two years and having like 105 songs. Then he went off and, you know, and um, spent a lot of time soul searching and, just getting this, uh, his thoughts, you know, and everything in line. And then I just remember him calling me and was like, yo, you know, we, we did my whole next album together. And I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, meet me at the studio. And I met him at the studio and I just remember him playing this body of work and it ended up being purpose. When you write a song, do you know in your gut if it's gonna be a hit or if it's just gonna be a good record? Sometimes. So it's like times where I could feel something in my stomach when I'm like, yo, this is really special. Like, where are you now? I felt was special. I felt like it was going to be a big record. What do you mean? I just wasn't sure. You know what I mean? Scooter was like, no, this is a smash. Um, so it's like 50-50, you know what I mean? I can't really, and I tell artists when I work, they ask me the same question. I'm like, look, all I can do is just use my formula. So take me through the process of writing a song. What is 
literally the first thing that you do when you're trying to hash this out? I'm gonna go to my phone and I'm gonna look up concepts that I've been jotting down. Do you mean like a topic or the like? The topic, yep, the title. The concept is like usually the title of the song, the idea, the main idea of the song. Then it's like the chords. Let's find the chords that move people's emotions. And then you usually start off doing the hook first, the most important part of the song. The hook for me is always supposed to be simple and effective. So simple enough for a five-year-old to sing along with, you know, unconsciously, subconsciously sing along with it, but then clever enough to stimulate, you know, a smart person. At this point, you've now worked with most of the biggest artists in music. Yeah. You've written tons of hits. What what are the itches that you still have left to scratch professionally? I would love to work with Celine Dion, man. Like that's like one of my like one of my dreams. And also, you know, put out a body of work under like, under myself. You said that most of the songs that were successful that you sold were mm -hmm. actually songs that you had written having fun for yourself. Yeah. You're now keeping some of those records mm -hmm. for your own personal project, mm -hmm. how do you manage that balance? It's awkward because I'm so used to not thinking about myself and just being selfless, you know? It's one of those things where I know I still want to have songs out there and I can keep a song for myself or I can send it to somebody and I can still be like, hey, I'm gonna send you a song, but I wanna use it for my album. You know what I mean? So it's just like, it gives it another angle. And you know, I'm at a, a place now where I just feel like it's naturally time for the world to just see another side of me and um, more of me. When did you finally feel established and stable? Not until like two years ago, man. When Where Are You Now came out and Purpose came out and Scooter Brown, you know, SB Projects coming in and, and managing me, and I just started feeling really, you know, secure and, and, and comfortable. You know, Justin is the first person to mention my name, you know. In my life, I've worked with a lot of artists, and I've written a lot of hits for a lot of artists, and nobody mentioned my name ever. It was always like, I didn't exist. So, Justin being the first person to say, oh no, I did this for Pooh Bear, Pooh Bear did this, no Pooh Bear, Pooh Bear. It was like, it was weird because I wasn't used to that credit. You know, I was used to getting publishing and getting checks, but I wasn't like used to people saying, oh wow, you the guy, you, you're Pooh Bear, you're the guy that, that does the, the Bieber record. So for him to tell the world and post pictures on Instagram and be like that loyal to me, it changed my life, it changed everything. During the ups and downs when you're chasing these checks and you don't really know, you know, where your next rent payment's gonna come from. Yeah. How were you able to focus and stay creative and stay putting out music? When you don't have options and your back is up against the wall, you deliver and you find yourself, you know, going, getting through moments that, you know, in reality, they're trying times, but there really just wasn't other, any other options. It was like, you know, you gotta go in and you gotta work and you gotta create music and you have to be honest, and it's not gonna be great every time, but you gotta keep doing it. I think that's kinda like what got me to this place, is like just not having a backup plan.